It is now time for oral questions, and I recognize the Leader of Her Majesty's loyal opposition. Uh, thank you so much, Speaker. My first uh, question this morning is for the Premier. Last um, Wednesday, in his daily news conference, uh, his daily campaign news conference on COVID-19, uh, the Premier claimed, and I quote, we see the curve going down. Well, since then, health officials have reported three of the worst days that Ontario has ever seen in terms of new cases of COVID-19. And today, the Ontario Hospital Association is sounding the alarm bells uh, because acute care wards are already operating above capacity in dozens of hospitals in our province. It's clear to everyone that we are still dealing with the consequences of the Ford government's failure to prepare properly for a second wave. Does the Premier think that declaring victory uh, is going to uh, have the thousands of new cases appearing daily just disappear? The Deputy Premier, the Minister of Health. Well, what I would say to the Leader of the Official Opposition is we have prepared. We have a comprehensive fall preparedness plan that anticipated an increase in the rise of COVID cases. And we've prepared for that, and we've prepared our hospitals for that as well. Uh, what I would say is that we are, first of all, we're very grateful to them for stepping up and their, um, the incredible frontline workers that show up to work each and every day. And uh, the hospitals have even gone beyond, above and beyond what their normal capacity is, and many of them have gone into our long-term care homes when they've needed assistance. But we have provided them with expansion availability. Right now, they are close to 100% capacity because they're dealing with COVID-19 cases, but they're also trying to catch up on the backlogs of surgeries and procedures that we had to postpone during the first wave. We don't want to have that happen again. We want to be able to keep those surgeries Thoughts? happening as well, because as terrible as it is to lose someone to COVID, it's equally terrible to lose someone to cardiac or cancer problems. So we have to keep that moving forward. The supplementary question. Thanks, Speaker. Well, after the first wave of the pandemic, labs and health units were left begging for funding to prepare for the second wave. And now we're in a situ situation where, in the City of Toronto, we don't know where 65 per cent of cases are actually coming from, while hospitals are facing huge deficits and operating above capacity. Will the Premier stop pretending that this pandemic is going to go away on its own and start making the invest investments needed to catch up to where we should be. Minister of Health. Well, the reality is that uh, we have been investing money. We have since the beginning of COVID uh, pandemic, both in terms of case and contact management. We're investing over a billion dollars in uh, testing facilities and case and contact management facilities so that we are able to trace where these contacts are coming from. And when someone comes down with COVID, that we can contact trace and find out who they've been co in contact with. Right now, we're at about 85 to 90% of contact management within 24 hours of someone being diagnosed with, with COVID. But we've also made significant investments in our hospital sector. We've invested $935 million in additional money in the sector this year. It's a 5.5% increase, the biggest increase in a decade. And we've made hundreds of millions of dollars in, in additional investments since then, which I can discuss in the Response. next supplemental. Leader of the Opposition. Well, Speaker, parents, seniors, small business owners, and all Ontarians are paying the price. They're paying the price now for the Premier's failure to prepare for the second wave. The Premier could admit that and make the overdue investments that are necessary uh, to get testing and tracing to where it should be and to ensure that our hospitals, schools, and small businesses have the support that they need to get through these next couple of months. But instead, the Premier is ignoring the evidence, and apparently, apparently so is the Minister, while members of his own caucus are ignoring public health advice. When will the Premier stop making things up as he goes, start making sure his caucus members are following the rules, and start making the investments that should have been in place months and months ago? Minister of Health. Well, in fact, we do have a comprehensive plan, one that is called Keeping Ontarians Safe, and it anticipates all of the issues that the uh, Leader of the op Official Opposition has just mentioned. Case and contact management, making sure that we can be prepared for surges in COVID cases, as well as keeping our surgeries and procedures going to keep Ontarians healthy. We've invested uh, 
$341 million to create an additional 500 acute care beds and 100 critical care beds. That was at the beginning. It was supplemented by more money that went into 139 more critical care beds and 1,349 additional beds, and recently by an additional $116 million that created uh, an additional 766 beds in 32 hospitals across the province. So as things stand now, since the start Fonts. of this pandemic, we have created 3,131 new hospital beds to deal with the increase in both patients with COVID, with flu. Thank you. Thank you. The next question, once again, the Leader of the Opposition. Thanks very much, Speaker. My next question is actually for the Premier as well. The government's failure to prepare for the second wave is especially devastating in long-term care, and I think we all know that. We are now at least 509 residents currently have COVID-19. In the face of unprecedented, this unprecedented disaster, the Ford government has dithered and delayed on action that was needed to save lives in long-term care. And we know that's the case. That's what the Commission heard in terms of testimony. So why is the Ford government moving so uh, slowly, Speaker? And when, uh, when will they start moving quickly? Because we all know that the lives of seniors in long-term care are truly at stake here. Minister of Long-Term Care. Thank you, Speaker, and thank you to the member opposite for the question. I, I can tell you that all of us uh, feel very concerned about our long-term care home residents and staff, and that is why we have acted swiftly since the very beginning, making sure that we created the regulatory flexibility for our long-term care homes with the regulatory amendments for emergency orders, $243 million to make sure that our staffing had support and infection control, ongoing uh, uh, measures to make sure that there were rapid deployment teams from their hospitals, integrating that response to our homes. And our homes the vast majority of them, 94 per cent of them right now, have no resident cases. And there are uh, uh, outbreaks, but I want to remind everyone that an outbreak means one resident case or one staff case as a minimum, and that staff case can be uh, isolating at home. So we are making sure that all the measures, including the $540 million to back up our homes in the, a few weeks ago, making sure every measure is taken. We will continue to do Thank you. And a supplementary question? It's unfortunate, Speaker, that the minister's uh, talking points don't include that 509 seniors are infected as we speak with COVID-19. A new testimony, in new testimony that's happening at the Long-Term Care Commission, Speaker, government officials were struggling to try to explain why staffing studies sat on the premier's desk literally for months while seniors died during the second wave. At one point, the lead commissioner uh, raises the issue of the urgent need the urgent need for four hours of daily hands-on care. Here's what he said, quote, we're in the middle of wave two. There's an immediacy to this, a sense of urgency, but what you're describing doesn't seem urgent. With so many lives at stake, how can this government fail to appreciate the urgent Question. need for action on four hours of hands-on care? Mr. Long-Term Care. Thank you, Speaker, and, and thank you again for the, the question. The, uh, the sense of urgency has been consistently there, 24 hours a day, seven days a week, uh, even since we started as a new ministry in the summer of 2019 to understand the staffing issues. We created the expert panel, the advisory panel, uh, to give a, a comprehensive understanding of what needed to be done, and that, that report will be completed with the strategy. Uh, uh, the report has been received. The strategy will be uh, in December. We have committed to doing that, and not only have we been doing that, we've been working urgently to shore up the staffing in our homes, using every measure possible, whether it's looking at uh, the Red Cross, community paramedics, Response. the integration with the, the, the hospitals and the acute care sector, the IPAC teams. This has all been Ongo ongoing with a sense of urgency from the very beginning, and we will continue with that same sense of urgency. Thank you very much. Final supplementary. Speaker, that is certainly not what the Commissioner said. So something doesn't add up here. It's literally a matter of life and death that we're talking about, and the Premier's response, quite clearly, has been to dither and delay. In testimony at that Long-Term Care Commission, uh, made public late Friday in government, uh, the government admits rather that, quote, it isn't government policy that there can't be three and four residents in a room. 
It isn't government policy. Well, we know that for-profit homes with massive outbreaks like Extend to Care, Starwood in Ottawa, and uh, many others have had shared uh, three residents sharing a room. So, the government promised to change that, just like they promised to change the staffing levels. They promised action, but everyone is urging, everybody's asking for urgent action. People Question. don't want the government to delay any longer. It's time to fix the problem. So when are they going to get around to banning more than two residents per room in long-term care? Mr. Long-term care. Thank you, Speaker, and, and thank you once again to the member opposite. Uh, making sure that we were absolutely transparent about the wardroom issue as soon as that was identified in Wave 1. We have been working with Public Health Ontario, Ontario Health, and um, uh, Medical Officers of Health within the public health units, looking at measures we can take to address the wardrooms using every possible measure, and all the while understanding the balance that must be had uh, in the acute care sector to create capacity in long-term care and create measures that allow our hospitals to stay function and serve those individuals who have, who have cancer, who have heart disease, and require urgent, urgent treatment. So all of this has to be an integrated effort. And I want to thank the commissioners for hearing uh, the testimony. And they did hear uh, about the staffing issues. And those, of course, have been ongoing, and, and we as a government have acknowledged that and, and are working feverishly to address that. And I want to thank the thousands of people that are working around the clock all during this terrible, unprecedented COVID-19 pandemic. Those people are making a difference. We thank you. Thank you very much. Next question, the member for Davenport. Good morning, Mr. Speaker. Thank you. This question is for the Premier. Speaker, throughout this pandemic, parents have tried to make the right choices to keep their kids safe, while also making sure they aren't set back a year in their learning. But thanks to a staggered and piecemeal ap approach that left class sizes too big and buses too crowded, thousands of students across this province never returned to school at all. In Toronto, 5,500 students didn't return. In London, 1,000. In Hamilton, the public board reports it's missing 1,756 kids. Speaker, we all know the way education is, on, is funded in Ontario, and that means that dollars follow students. Enrollment has been completely disrupted by the pandemic and by this government's inconsistent policies. The corresponding drop in funding for those students will mean millions of dollars budgeted for schools will vanish unless the Premier asks, acts, will he? Government, Government House Leader. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. appreciate the, the question from the member opposite. Look, the member opposite knows that uh, the Minister of Education and the Premier have committed uh, uh, significant, uh, in fact, historic uh, uh, amounts to, uh, to education. Obviously, this is a, a, a challenging time, uh, uh, not only for the people of the province of Ontario, for our students, uh, uh, but uh, school boards, who have done, frankly, a spectacular job in helping assure that the funding that we have set aside for, uh, for schools uh, uh, during the pandemic is getting to the students. Uh, I know from my own experience in, in, in my board and my kids, uh, uh, one in the Catholic system, one in the in the public system. The experience has been uh, nothing short of spectacular, and I want to, uh, uh, I guess, opposite of what the member is, is saying, uh, uh, congratulate uh, the teachers and the two boards that I am uh, fortunate enough to to work with. They've done a great job. Students uh, are, are responding. It is certainly different, Mr. Speaker, but they're getting the job done, and I want to thank our educators for that. A supplementary question, Mr. Speaker. If boards and schools are doing such a great job, keep the money there. Give them the assurance they need. Repeating the same numbers from back in August is not going to make these problems go away. The minister needs to listen to families, listen to frontline workers in our schools. Many have taken to social media using the hashtag Aunt Ed Reality to share what's really happening. One teacher wrote that as families were trying to make Halloween as fun for their kids as possible, he was busy rearranging classrooms once again to accommodate even more students as classes are collapsed and class sizes continue to grow. Others are asking, where are these new custodians? Speaker, Ontario's COVID cases are breaking records every few days. We can no longer wait to see how this will all pan out. We need urgent action to protect our students and keep schools open as long as possible. Will the Premier take action now? Thank you. Government House Leader. 
Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Of, of course, we have continued uh, right from the beginning of the, uh, of, uh, of the pandemic. Uh, uh, took very swift action to ensure that our students uh, uh, that our students were safe. We did that by working with uh, not only our school boards but with our education partners, our, our, the union leaders, uh, to make sure that we rolled out a system that worked uh, as best as it could for the students of the province of Ontario. Uh, will we continue to invest in students? Absolutely. We've done that right since our first budget, Mr. Speaker. We are the only government uh, to make significant investments in education in such a short period of time. I'm quite proud of that, Mr. Speaker. This is a very challenging time, obviously. Surely to goodness, the member opposite can, can appreciate how difficult it has been to bring forward uh, online learning, to bring forward uh, uh, protection for our students, those who want to go to school, and those uh, and for the teachers. We've been able to do that. It has been a success. Response. Does that mean, Mr. Speaker, that we, we stop? No. We, of course, redouble our efforts because parents will do different things and students will want different things. This government will be prepared for whatever our parents and whatever our students want by working with our teachers and our educators to make sure we get it right. Thank you. The next question, the member for Barry Innisfil. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is to the Minister of Economic Development and Job Creation and Trade. Last week, the Minister joined me, the Premier and the, member, and the MPP for Barry Springwater Oramadante to meet uh, Wilfred and his wife Ingrid. Wilfred is a German tool and die maker who came from Germany, and his wife Ingrid co-founded Napoleon in, in the late 1970s in Barry. And as we heard, they are now a North America's leader when it comes to manufacturing quality fireplaces, grills, furnaces, and air conditioners, all because because Wolfgang tried to impress his father-in-law by making a wood stove. That had led, of course, to uh, them stepping up to the plate like so many manufacturers, where during COVID-19, and as we're still in it, Napoleon workers put the grills on hold and they started to make medical equipment. They're an example, along with their sons, Christopher and Stephen, of manufacturers that really stepped up to the plate. And so I'm looking uh, for the minister to tell us in this house how we're supporting manufacturers like Napoleon and what our government is helping to do to help manufacturers Great thrive. Question. Minister of Economic Development, Job Creation and Trade. Speaker, thank you to the member from Barrie and Isfil for her question. Uh, let's start with a shout out to uh, Ingrid and Wolfgang and Stephen and Chris Schroeder for hosting us at Napoleon uh, Home Comfort. Their 1,100 employees prove that Ontario is indeed a manufacturing powerhouse. In September alone, Ontario saw an increase of nearly 52 thousand manufacturing jobs. That means that 17,000 more people work in manufacturing now than did pre-COVID. And that proves that even in times of the pandemic, we can make anything right here in the province, and, Speaker, we should be proud of that. By purchasing Ontario-made products, we can put billions of dollars Response. back into our economy and lead our province down the road to recovery. Thank you, Minister, for that answer. And as stated at Plant Magazine, not even COVID-19 can dose the sizzle on Napoleon barbecues. Our government continues to be a leader and champion when it comes to highlighting and supporting Ontario Ontario's made businesses. And several months ago, of course, we launched the Made in Ontario program that helped uh, really support manufacturers through the Manufacturing and Exporters Association by highlighting our businesses and, of course, creating the Ontario Made logo, which you can proudly support onto our Ontario Made products so that people know when they go to the stores, what products they can buy that are made in Ontario. And in recent polls, we have seen that 73% of Canadians want to buy local made product. And in fact, 56% of Ontarians wish they could uh, purchase more domestic products. So I'm asking the minister if he could share with my constituents and all Ontarians Question. what new developments we have for the Ontario Made program. Minister of Economic Development. Thank, thank you, Speaker. The Canadian manufacturers and exporters uh, launched the Ontario Made program, but that was only the beginning. Today, we're excited to announce the launch of the second phase of Ontario Made. So when you see that Ontario Made logo, it's easier for shoppers to tell what products are actually produced right here in Ontario. And to date, 4,600 products are registered with that logo from 1,200 Ontario manufacturers. That's 4,600 quality Ontario Made products supporting local jobs. 
Speaker, it was great to see the Ontario Made logo on Beauty Tone paint when uh, I dropped by the Ferris Home Hardware in, uh, in uh, North Bay this weekend. So we Response. urge people to go to supportontariomade.ca for a complete directory of these 1,200 companies. Next question, the member for Essex. Thank you very much, Speaker. My question is to the Premier. Speaker, we all know that the Premier has a close personal relationship with Charles McVitie. Uh, he's even trying to grant him his own version of Trump University North. And Speaker, I cringe at the thought of what an ethics degree from McVitie U would look like. But Speaker, it appears that he's not uh, McVitie's only friend in the PC party caucus. In now deleted photos from McVitie's lavish birthday party last November, we see a special video greeting from the Premier and also appearances from the Chief Government Whip, the Associate Minister of Mental Health and Addictions, and the Minister of Finance. Mysteriously, Speaker, these photos have all disappeared on their website as of last Thursday night. Speaker, do any of the ministers who attended that party know if Canada Christian College's accreditation was discussed? And if so, why have those photos disappeared? To respond to the government, the Minister of Colleges and Universities. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I'm glad uh, to have this opportunity to rise and, and address this uh, important matter. Uh, anytime any organization or any individual applies for any type of a license or a designation, it's incumbent upon legislators, people in quasi-judicial functions, to ensure that there is fairness and there is accountability in the process. The main way to ensure accountability is through transparency. Things like having bills debated openly in this House. The main way to ensure fairness is to ensure that there is a process. Order. There are three ways for any Order. designation of this, this nature to be granted. One, through a private bill. Goes directly to committee tabled by any member of this house does not come into this house for open discussion very sheltered process second option is through ministerial consent i'll speak about that in the supplemental third option is through a legislative process once again that gets debated in this house what we chose to do mr speaker was to blend a ministerial consent Response. and a legislative process to ensure transparency to ensure accountability to ensure fairness to ensure a process mr speaker thank you a supplementary question Thank you very much, Speaker. Speaker, despite concerns coming from his own PC party members, the Premier has spent weeks defending his favour to Charles McVitie by claiming it's all above board following due process. But we now know that McVitie had unrestricted access to the Premier's cabinet ministers and closest advisers at this event. Nobody can know for sure what was said at McVitie's birthday bash, but I don't think anyone would believe that government business never came up. Speaker, were any of the members of the Premier's cabinet that were present at that party lobbied at the party, or are they just really such good, close allies of Charles McVitie? Mr. Colleges and Universities. Thank you again, Mr. Speaker. Again, to ensure a fair and accountable process, what we have done and what we've endeavored to do and we will always do on this side of the House is making sure that fairness, process, accountability are adhered to. These are principles, principles of the rule of law that I certainly take very seriously and we on this side of the House take very, very seriously. If you look at the private bill option, which I discussed in the earlier, uh, in the earlier question, that option goes directly to a committee. Very sheltered process. Would not have been debated in this House. Would not have been a very transparent process. Ministerial consent, Mr. Speaker, is something that is traditionally done in a minister's boardroom, signed off on. We converted that in the last red tape bill last October, Mr. Speaker, where two other universities, OCAD universities and Algoma Order. University, were part of that as well. We ensured that that process went directly to an independent review board, being PCAP. What we've done here with Response. this particular legislation, same we did before, same we'll do again, is we made sure that it was all combined in a blended, open, transparent process, Mr. Speaker. Next question, the member for Ottawa, Vanier. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is for the Minister of Long-Term Care. And Speaker, I need to keep on asking these questions because I keep on hearing from people in my writing that the situation in our long-term care homes is far from being resolved. I receive updates from administrators of these for-profit long-term care homes, and while they're trying to be reassuring, it's really easy to read between the lines. 
In fact, they're trying to tell us that everything is under control by saying they have a very comprehensive infection prevention and control program and say in the same letter that they are working with the hospital team to develop procedures to manage the outbreak because they can't control anything. I've heard from family members and caregivers, and there are still delays in getting tested and getting, and getting results while the vi virus continues to spread. So my question is, will the minister ensure that testing is improved and prioritized in the long-term care homes? To reply for the government, the Minister of Long-Term Care. Thank you, Speaker, and thanks again uh, to the member opposite for the question. And This is something I want to emphasize is ongoing, making sure that our homes are getting the staffing they need, the PPE uh, support that they need. Uh, there are no uh, critical situations with the homes. There's no critical staffing shortages. The, the homes are working, in some cases, it's voluntary management contracts or management manda uh, mandatory management orders with the hospitals involved. In the Ottawa area, there are four homes that have resident cases. Uh, the others do not, even though they are considered an outbreak, and that's because of the definition that I, I keep mentioning. Uh, also making sure that there's communication with families, and I think that that is something that is one of those lessons learned, uh, that we are making sure that those homes have the ability to communicate with their, their, their loved ones. Um, looking at making sure we have the infection prevention and control uh, measures in there. These homes are all partnered uh, with hospitals across the province to make sure that they have the necessary expertise. So I thank you for your question. The supplementary question. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and again to the Minister of Long-Term Care. I, I do want to congratulate the Minister on the paramedicine program that I've heard of. And based on the consultations I've done, around long-term care and based on my own experience of having my mother living with us, I believe this can go a long way in helping our loved ones and those who look after them. Essential caregivers are indeed very important part of the solution for providing much needed support to the system. And it's really important that they have access to their loved ones in long-term care homes to provide much needed support. We need to realize that more often than not, these essential caregivers are seniors themselves looking after a relative or a spouse. The Champlain Family Council has reached out to me and to the minister to make us aware that the obstacles to getting tested have undermined their role as caregivers. Question. My question on behalf of all the family members who are taking care of loved ones in long-term care is, will the minister ensure that rapid testing be given ongoing priority in long-term care settings and that it includes caregivers? Thank you. Minister of Health. Thank the member very much for the question. Testing is very important because uh, for caregivers because we recognize through Wave 1 how important these caregivers are. They provide, in some cases, up to 80 percent of the care that their loved ones receive in long-term care. And it's very important for their, for their mental functioning and physical functioning. But we have allowed for that with opening up pharmacies for asymptomatic testing. It can be family members that can go into pharmacies, receive a quick turnaround and receive a, a, a quick answer about uh, not having COVID and being able to see their family members. But we're also looking at the new strains of testing that are coming forward, uh, some of which are point of care testing, and we're going to give them in priority to uh, both residents of long-term care homes, staff members, as well as essential caregivers, because you're absolutely right, these essential caregivers Bonds. are truly essential to be there with the ones they love during COVID-19. Thank you very much. The next question, the member for Mississauga Lakeshore. Speaker, my question is for the Attorney General. Constituents in my riding need to know that their government supports local efforts to prevent and fight crime in their community. They appreciate the work our government is doing to support the work of local police, prosecutors, victim service organizations, and other community partners who are working together to stand up for law-abiding citizens, support victims of crime, and dismantle the criminal network that prey on the profits of young and vulnerable people in our community. Speaker, we know human trafficking has targeted Ontario communities, and our government has established a comprehensive and province-wide approach to fight these crimes. What is the government doing to hold criminals accountable and keep uh, communities safe from human trafficking? Great question. Questions to the Attorney General. 
I thank the great member from Mississauga Lakeshore for the question and for the opportunity to tell Ontarians what our government is doing to support victims of crime. Just last week, I announced that our government is reinvesting cash seized from criminals to help fight heinous crimes like human trafficking across Ontario. Our government is investing a total of $2.5 million through the Civil Remedies Grant Program to support 33 local crime-fighting projects that will make communities safer. This year, we're, we focused on investments in helping communities fight back against human trafficking. Money collected from proceeds of crime will be reinvested into support programming and will also go towards crisis counselling and public education. In fact, in the member's riding, we invested nearly 100000 in Project Haven with the Peel Re Police Service. Project Haven will use technology and surveillance equipment to locate and support victims of human trafficking and ensure those responsible for exploiting them are identified and prosecuted. Response. Mr. Speaker, we are taking money out of the hands of criminals and putting it directly back in the hands of those who will make an important contribution to support victims of crime. Supplementary question, member for Sarnia-Lambton. Speaker, and my question is to the Attorney General as well. Minister, while the uh, news of funding is welcome, Ontarians need certainty that the government is providing resources to get at the roots of criminal activity like human trafficking so there are less victims. Ontarians and the constituents in my riding need to know that unlike the Liberals and the NDP, this government will support our law enforcement so that they can do their job and prevent crime like human trafficking from occurring. Can the Attorney General commit to this House that this funding is more than a Band-Aid solution to a problem that impacts so many and that it will in fact provide direct support to law enforcement and the prevention of crime. The Attorney General. Thank you again, Mr. Speaker. I'd like to thank the member from Sarnia. And let me make it clear to all members. Under our government, crime will not pay. Much of the $2.5 million investment in the Civil Remedies Grant Program will go directly to funding law enforcement programs that fight back against human traffickers by supporting the efforts of local police and prosecutors to dismantle the criminal networks that prey and profit from young and vulnerable people in all of our communities. In fact, in, in the members' riding, we're providing over $75,000 to the Sarnia Police Service to ensure they have the training and surveillance equipment they need to locate and prosecute those involved in human and drug trafficking, as well as aid the victims of crime. I'd also like to highlight that our government has made it harder for criminals to hold on to proceeds of their crimes through the Smarter and Stronger Justice Act passed in this House. It was passed just this past this summer. By strengthening the civil forfeiture laws and catching up with the rest of Canada, we've taken real action to hold offenders accountable, support victims of crime, and build safer communities. Thank you. The next question, the member for Toronto St. Paul's. This is to the, de the Deputy Premier. The Deputy Premier went to great lengths to try to distance herself from Charles McVitie. On Thursday, she told the media she was uncomfortable with the suggestion that this government stands for racist or homophobic behaviour. Speaker, the Deputy Premier is more worried about the reputation of her government than the lives of queer and trans people and of Muslim Ontarians and others attacked on a constant basis by Mr. Charles McVitie. Why is the Deputy Premier more worried about the brand of her party than the lives of queer and trans people constantly attacked by the hateful and bigoted Charles McVitie. Thank you. Mr. Colleges and Universities. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and very happy to rise and address this question. We believe in the rule of law. I've indicated that. We believe in the Charter. Perhaps my background, Mr. Speaker, as a lawyer myself, dealt with issues around the Charter all the time. Section 7 of the Charter, which guarantees fundamental freedoms to us all. Section 15, guaranteeing equality under the law. Guaranteeing equality for all. Order. We want to ensure Order. that we have fair processes. Fair processes for all. Fair processes that ensure that any individual, any organization, when applying for any kind of a license or a designation, has a fair and transparent process. It is not for any one individual Order. to determine how a single individual will be weighed in these processes. What's important is that we have a fair process. We have that, Mr. Speaker. We have taken a ministerial consent process. We've taken a legislative process. We have married those two processes together. We've done Response. it before. We did it with Algoma University. We did it with OCADU, and we've done it with three institutions in this legislation right now, Mr. Speaker. Order. 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 Supplementary question. Again to the Deputy Premier, hoping she'll answer this time. Speaker, Charles McVitie claimed in 2010 
that sex education would lead to queer adults preying on children. He said, quote, they want to proselytize your children and mine, our grandchildren, and turn them into homosexuals, end quote. He suggested every queer person is a pedophile, and he spewed all of that vile hate while taking for himself and his son nearly a million dollars from his college. Speaker, if the Deputy Premier is really worried about the brand of her party, she should be worried with the fact that Charles McVitie's college requires members to sign a form proving that they're homophobic and transphobic. Will the Deputy Premier vote against this legislation to give Charles McVitie an even bigger platform to spew his hatred and bigotry Question. against queer and trans people? Yes or no? Thank you. I ask the members to please take their seats. Minister of Colleges and Universities to respond. Thank you again, Mr. Speaker. Again, Mr. Speaker, I can respect the question. I could respect where it comes from. Because we can all respect the importance of equality. We can all respect the importance of ensuring that we have processes that are free of hate. But processes, Mr. Speaker, when any individual is applying for licenses or designation, require procedural fairness. They require that the rule of law be adhered to. They require a process that everybody can have an opportunity to have a part in, state their beliefs, state how they feel about it. That gives us the opportunity to make good judicious decisions. We are here, Mr. Speaker, following a process. We are following the most transparent process Order. there possibly is, open debate in this House. We are following an independent review process, Mr. Speaker. Response. There is no other process Order. that exists that is more fair and accountable than the process we are following, Mr. Speaker. Thank you very much. Next question, the member for Orléans. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, about a month ago, uh, the Premier uh, said that his plan was working while the Chief Medical Officer of Health in Ottawa was saying that there was an impending health care crisis in the nation's capital. A week later, of course, the Premier put Toronto, Ottawa and Peel into an enhanced social and economic uh, restrictions, Mr. Speaker. Last week, uh, the Premier told Ontarians that we would see new modelling. And that modeling would show good news that cases uh, and were going down, that the curve was going down, Mr. Speaker. And of course, his medical team the next day showed us that, in fact, cases uh, are going up. How can Ontarians trust what is said when every time the P speaker, when every time the premier speaks on the status of COVID-19 in Ontario, uh, he's almost immediately disputed by his own medical experts? Deputy Premier and Minister of Health. Thank you. Well, I, th I thank the member very much for the question, and the reality is that COVID has taken many turns in the province of Ontario. We've gone through wave one. We're clearly in wave two. Our numbers are high. Uh, for a period of time, it looked as if the numbers were uh, lowering somewhat in uh, the Ottawa area in particular, but the numbers have gone back up. That is what happens. The Premier spoke at the time, and that's the way that it was. But the numbers have gone back up, and all we can uh, ask of Ontarians is to please continue following those important public health measures, maintain physical distancing, wear a mask if you can't do that, make sure you follow complete hand hygiene, stay home if you're feeling ill. That is the, uh, the number one rule for dealing with COVID, and make sure that uh, you do everything that you can to follow that, and that Once. that's how we truly get the numbers down, and that's what we're asking all Ontarians to do. The supplementary question. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. My supplemental is also for the Minister of Health. Uh, clear and concise information from the government is paramount uh, during an emergency, Mr. Speaker. In some cases, the Premier tells us he's taking his advice from medical experts. In other times, he takes his advice uh, from uh, elected MPPs uh, and mayors. One day, he's telling us that cases are going down. The next day, his own medical experts are saying, no, uh, cases are going up. One day later, uh, Mr. Speaker, there doesn't seem to be any objective measure, criteria, or basis for some of the decisions uh, the Premier is making. There's no strategy, there's no thought, uh, and it seems that he's just whacking away at problems. I'll do something over here today, something over there uh, tomorrow, Mr. Speaker. So when will the government come clean with the people of Ontario, become transparent in, the, in their decision-making, how they're choosing winners and losers Question. in this economy, uh, and stop taking a whack-a-mole approach uh, to COVID-19? Minister of Health to reply. 
very much, Speaker. And in fact, there is a very comprehensive measured approach that we're taking to dealing with wave two of COVID-19. It's all part of the fall preparedness plan that has been available to all members of this house and the members of the public for weeks now. It has six pillars and we're following each one of those pillars. We want to make sure that people follow the health measures. We want to make sure that people can still have their procedures and surgeries done. We're ready for an increase in COVID cases or in flu cases. We're ready for all of that. That is the, the path that we're following and uh, we are sticking with the plan because it is working. We haven't had the, the uh, huge mass uptakes in COVID as we've witnessed around the world, but our numbers are still higher than I think any of us would want to see. And we're taking the public health approach that we need to take to deal with that. The Premier has been very clear from the beginning of this pandemic that he's going to Response. take the advice of the medical experts, Dr. Williams, the public health measures table, and the many other people who are providing advice, giving clinical advice. Thank you very much. Thank you. The next question, the member for Don Valley North. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is for P.S. Meek. Speaker, the COVID-19 pandemic has brought uncertainty to many industries across, across the province. In Ontario, the mining sector employs over 72,000 workers in mining sites as part of the mining supply chain. And here in Toronto, the mining investment capital of the world. Can P.S. Smith tell this house how our government is supporting the critical mining and minerals development sector during this difficult time? Thank you. The parliamentary assistant and the member for Peterborough Court. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And through you, I'd like to thank the member from Don Valley North for that question. In 2019 alone, our mining industry produced more than $10 billion. To interrupt the member, it's uh, inappropriate to direct a question to a parliamentary assistant. Um, you, were you going to intend to give it to a minister or? To the minister. Mining. Oh, Ministry of Mining, uh, Energy and Mining. So do we allow the question? Pierre, Pierre Depp. Okay, so you, you, you intended to put the question to the Minister responsible for mining, and the Parliamentary Assistant, Member for Peterborough, Kawartha, will reply on behalf of the government. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. As I was saying, in 2019 alone, the mining industry produced more than $10 billion worth of minerals almost a quarter of all that was produced in Canada. Time and time again, Ontario's exploration and mining companies have led the way in corporate social responsibility and sustainability. And this has never been more apparent than during COVID-19. I want to thank the entire mining industry for its rapid and compassionate response to the pandemic, for sharing our commitment in protecting the health and safety of everyone. Because of their commitment, we were able to act quickly and decisively to designate the mining industry and the minerals Response. as essential during COVID-19, protecting the health and safety of those workers while protecting those important jobs will continue to be our priority. Supplementary question. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and thank you to P.S. Smith uh, for the answer. Speaker, I also want to appreciate all of Ontario's corporate championship who share our commitment to protect the health and safety of workers during this COVID-19 pandemic. Can Pierre Smith please elaborate on other initiatives our government is taking to support the mining and mineral sector at this time? Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Ontario is continuing down the path of economic recovery by reducing administrative burdens on industry. The latest iteration of our red tape reduction bill, the Better for People, Smarter for Business Act, if passed, will improve the administrative efficiency of the Mining Act. The proposed changes will clarify and update the mining lands administrative system to fill gaps and create a better user experience for proponents. These proposed changes will also ensure the minister can respond swiftly to future global or provincial crisis. While our work is far from over, I'm confident that Ontario will continue to take our rightful place as a leading jurisdiction for global mining innovation and investment. 
helping to fuel our economic recovery while supplying the world with critical minerals that will power technology of tomorrow. The next question, the member for Nickelbelt. Thank you, Speaker. My question is to the Minister of Health. The request for flu shots from Ontario is really great. We all understand that we have our part to do to get rid of this virus, and to get a flu shot is a step in that direction. Unfortunately, the government seems really ill-prepared. I have an email from Caroline Family Health Team sent to their patient on the wait list for a few shot, flu shot, and I quote, We placed an order for 1,500 shots with public health. This request has been declined. Supply was and continues to be the major impediment at this time. Unfortunately, this is completely out of our control. Public health has not given any confirmation of future flu shot supply, if any. End of quote. And this is the same thing all over, Speaker. I agree with the Minister that vaccines have always been delivered in batches, but we knew when the next batch was coming and we knew how many doses we would get. What's happening? Minister of Health. Well, thank you very much for the question. In fact, this is the uh, we started this flu season wanting to have the largest flu campaign in Ontario's history, and it's happening. I'm very, very grateful to the people of Ontario that have gone out to get their flu shots. We ordered last year, long before the pandemic ever was thought of, we ordered 5.1 million doses, which was uh, 700,000 more than we'd ordered the year before. We were then able to obtain another 350,000 doses with the assistance of the federal government, 5.45 million doses. I can tell you that as of today, uh, at far, just at pharmacies, over one million doses have already been given to people. Whereas this time last year, it was 150,000 and we almost had to beg people to come in to get the flu vaccine. Over one million doses already. So this is Response. a very successful flu campaign. And I'm very, as I said, very grateful that the people of Ontario are coming forward to get the flu shot. And the supplementary question. Caroline Family Health Team is not the only one. In my writing, City of Lake Family Health Team wrote to the minister, and I quote, Our family health team was notified by public health that flu shot would be quite limited this year and that pharmacies would be getting more than in previous year. So we phoned the pharmacies. For Shopper Drug Mart in Hanmer, their flu shot full tool says flu shot not available. So we called the pharmacist. She advised us that they, have, they do not have any. Guardian Pharmacy in Chelmsford, they do not have any. Same thing with the high dose. IDA Pharmacy in Lavac, they do not have any and do not know when they will get more. Rexall is cancelling book flu shots appointment. Hmm. What is going on, Minister? We both know that if access to flu vaccine is too difficult, people will simply stop trying, and a pillar of our pandemic response will collapse with the consequences we all fear. Aachen thinks that Ontario Question. always did well in the past go so wrong. <laughs> Mr. Kelly. Well, actually, things are going right. As I indicated, a record number of Ontarians have come forward to have the flu shot. We also prioritized our most vulnerable uh, population, people in long-term care homes and retirement homes, other places of congregate living. We want to make sure that those people can be protected and people who are in hospitals as well. But we've also, as part of our fall plan, set aside another $28.5 million in the event that we needed to purchase more flu shots. And I can advise you that I have already been in contact with the Federal Minister of Health, Minister Patty Haidu, to, uh, to inquire about their flu reserve. They do have a reserve of shots. We are a trying to procure some from that, and we're also dealing with those global manufacturers directly to uh, procure more supplies from places around the world. So we are, because people still want to get the flu shot, we are working uh, to get those additional shots that people have indicated they want. But this is the biggest flu campaign Ontario has ever had in its history. Next question, the member for Lanark, Frontenac, Kingston. Thank you, Speaker. Speaker, my question is to the Minister of Health. There's a difference between theory and practice. Last week, Dr. Paul Rumoliotis, Eastern Ontario Medical Officer of Health, complained to the media, and I quote, I'm getting too much criticism from doctors and experts in infectious diseases, epidemiology, immunology, and intensive care. Real doctors, those who treat patients, disagree with this dangerous theoretical experiment you and your overpaid public health doctors are practicing. 
Tens of thousands of doctors in Ontario and around the world are using science, facts, and their first-hand experience to challenge the lockdown narrative from public health. Minister, you can delegate authority, but Question. in a democracy, you cannot abdicate responsibility. When will you acknowledge, like all those doctors, that your lockdown experiments are doing far more harm than they are good? Minister of Health. Thank you, Speaker, and uh, thank you for the question. But we have, uh, from the very beginning, indicated that any decisions that are made with respect to COVID-19 are going to be based on science, science and facts, as you refer to it, and that's what we're using, clinical evidence. What is going to respond to this epidemic? How are we going to keep the people of Ontario safe? And that's what we've done every step along the way. Now, there are many doctors out there. There's other public health doctors. Not everyone is going to be of the same opinion. However, we have a very competent chief medical officer of health in Dr. Williams, uh, very competent people at Public Health Ontario, and around the public health measures table. Those are the people who provide us with recommendations based on the facts, based on the science, what's going to keep the people of Ontario safe, and that's the advice that we've been taking throughout Response. this entire pandemic. And the supplementary question? Again, to the Minister of Health, you, you stated that you're using cl clinical evidence, but that's not quite true, is it? The, um, you're using bureaucratic opinion. Please withdraw the unparliamentary comment. Yeah. Place your question. It's not just practicing doctors and specialists that see your approach as causing damage and injury. Ontario and Manitoba's former public health officers, Dr. Richard Chavez and Dr. Joel Kettner, are opposed to these dangerous lockdowns as well. Real doctors who treat patients and specialists and, uh, oppose this as well. But you don't listen. You don't even listen to the caucus and other... Make your comments through the chair. You only listen to Dr. David Williams. Make your comments through the chair. Or I'll cut. When will you start to listen and stop the suffering? I'll remind all members to make their comments through the chair. Minister of Health to reply. Well, I would invite the member, through you, Speaker, to consider what would have happened if we didn't do anything in Ontario. We could very well be in the same situation that Europe is in right now. Hundreds and hundreds of thousands of cases with their uh, emergency departments, with their hospitals being overwhelmed. We had to take some action. We know these measures will work. We're seeing the numbers starting to go down, not to the level that any of us would like to see, but they are maintaining at a plateau. I would like to see them go lower, as would you, but we don't have I apologize to the Minister of Health. Member for Lanark, Frontenac, Kingston will come to order. Minister of Health can reply. Speaker. Uh, we are relying on the evidence of frontline doctors because there's Dr. Williams, there's the uh, public health measures table, but there are many, many Spons? doctors behind that that give them their response as well. It's not just one or two doctors. We are consulting with many doctors across the province. Thank you. The next question. Thank you, thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is for the Premier. Last week, Canada's top public health doctor released a report on community COVID outcomes outlining what we in York Southwestern already know and have been speaking about for months now. When it comes to getting hit with COVID-19, your postal code matters as much as your genetic code. Data shows that socially and economically disadvantaged groups with seniors, women, disabled people and immigrants and marginalized workers who deliver essential services bearing the brunt of the pandemic. Will the Premier finally recognize the regional inequities like those that exist in Toronto Northwest seriously and deliver the resources and support our community so desperately needs and has been asking for this government? Minister of Health, reply. 
Well, I thank the member very much for the question. You're absolutely right. There are some regional areas where there are inequities, where there are a number of people that aren't coming forward to be tested. And we know that when we uh, st started taking testing by appointment at the assessment centers, that uh, many of these groups weren't coming forward. So what we are doing is going to them. So we have opened up some pop-up centers, some mobile testing units. Some of the hospitals are doing a great job in reaching out. Uh, the uh, Michael Guerin Hospital is doing a great job, Unity and UHN. They're already reaching out through some of the community partners that are already providing services. They're the people that uh, many um, recent uh, people from, to Ontario trust. They go there for their other health services. So this is a really important trusting relationship and that they can go and be tested there. Uh, Response? To, um, because when we have a vaccine, that's also going to be important when we come forward with that to have those trust trusted relationships so that people will get the vaccine too when it's available. The supplementary question, the member for Humber River Black Creek. Uh, my question is to the Acting Premier. Again, Toronto's Northwest neighbourhoods continue to be amongst the hardest hit in our province. My neighbourhood is one of them. So is the Premier's. The reasons are socio-economic, they are structural, and we need targeted solutions. Something that would help would be the establishment of community liaisons to fight COVID-19 on the ground, to address language barriers by working with different communities in their own languages, making sure the information that could save lives is heard and followed by everyone. Their strategies would be tailored to each neighbourhood. I raised this at the Select Committee for Emergency Management Oversight, and the Solicitor General said this request was indeed reasonable. Acting Premier, our communities are counting on us. Will you commit to funding the establishment of community liaisons to help the neighbourhoods who have been hardest hit? Deputy Premier. Well, what I can definitely commit to is that we recognize the issues that exist in some neighborhoods. We are providing that support. We are making sure, first of all, that people can be tested and that uh, when the vaccine comes forward, they will be able to get the vaccine as well. But I think the overall, what we're trying to do, and, and very similar to what you mentioned, is making sure that we can wrap around people with their health care services. That's why we undertook the transformation in the first place, the creation of Ontario Health and the local Ontario Health teams that can not just the local service health service providers but the social service providers as well so that they will know if they are dealing with a patient that has some health needs maybe they also have a food security problem or uh, having a problem paying rent a lot of the socioeconomic factors that we keep talking about wanting to bring into health that's what we're trying to do with response this transformation. and that is going to be uh, the greatest help to these communities in need the next question, the member for London, or Ottawa South. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. My question is for the uh, Minister of Colleges and Universities. Speaker, Charles McVitie has demonstrated over the years his Islamophobic, homophobic, and transphobic views. These hateful views, they're really well documented, so I'm not, I'm not going to recite them now because we all know them. And yet, under the COVID-19 Economic Recovery Act, this government is returning favors, and about to give Mr. McVitie a special deal, a very special deal in, indeed. Supporting Mr. McVitie's special deal is an endorsement. M Member knows full well he can't impute motive. I ask him to be very careful with his language. Please. Thank you, Speaker. I'll withdraw. Supporting Mr. McVitie's hateful views, I see, is a direct endorsement and it says a lot about our Premier and his pri party's priorities during this pandemic. So, Speaker, through you to the Minister. Question. Can the Minister explain why he thinks that Mr. McVitie's hateful views have any place in any Ontario school? Minister of Colleges and Universities. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The member opposite knows very well that our Premier and our entire government's number one priority throughout this entire pandemic has been the health and safety of every single individual in this province, and we've done an exceptional job combating this pandemic, and I'm personally very proud of the work of our Premier, of our Minister of Health, and all of our caucus and all of our colleagues in Cabinet and the work we have done during this pandemic. And you know what, Mr. Speaker, I believe the people of Ontario also feel the same way about that. We've done an exceptional job. and. Uh, it, that is just an inappropriate reference from the member opposite. When, with respect to the issue that has been canvassed here today and over the last few weeks, this says absolutely everything 
to do with fairness and transparency, accountability, the rule of law, making sure that when any individual, any organization Response. makes an application for some type of a license or designation, that there's a fair and transparent process, Mr. Speaker, and that's what we have here. Thank you. Supplementary question. So, Speaker, it's not about process. Not at all. It's not about process. The whole thing just stinks. We all know it. I can see it when I look over there. You know too. You all know. And the Deputy Premier said as much last week in a scrum. You know. So quite frankly, I'm surprised that the government's hell-bent on moving forward with this. And given the financial revelations of last week, it kind of looks like it might be a bit of a piggy bank. So I don't understand why you are so fixed on moving forward with this. Case counts are rising. Outbreaks, serious outbreaks are happening in long-term care. Testing and tracing is order. not where it needs to be. So I government don't side come to order. this is such a priority for this government. There are so many other things we should be talking about right now. Quite frankly, I'm embarrassed. Order. Speaker, it's embarrassed that I have to ask this question, question. in 2020. Will the Minister of Colleges and Universities do the right thing and tell the Premier to withdraw Schedule 2 of Bill 213? Thank you. Again, I'll ask all members to make their comments to the Chair. Minister of Colleges and Universities to reply. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Under that former government, Mr. Speaker, that member who was a part of the former government, a process to obtain this type of a designation would take over three years in some cases. Last year in our fall red tape bill, last October, we introduced Order. a simplified ministerial consent process where applications went directly to PCAB, an independent reviewing agency. We added in that legislation additionally we put in legislation for Burkhad University and Algoma University to bring it forward into legislation. Along with that, independent reviewed PCAB process. Now, in this particular legislation we have here, three institutions are coming forward in the exact same process, a transparent, open, accountable process. One Fonts. that is being followed to a T, Mr. Speaker, one that we have followed in the past, Mr. Speaker, and one that ensures people have fairness. Thank you. That concludes question period. House stands in recess until 1 p.m.